Welcome to the Polar Bear Club this morning. We're going to be having the dive in the pond out there. Well, you heard my great joke, right? That this is the polar bear. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah, I tried really hard. God keeps me humble all the time. <laughs> Last week, Eric was sharing with us about uh, having a group that's been getting together with being led by three of the elders. And uh, John Sharp was involved in that and some other people. Talking about the direction that the church is trying to go, we charge this group with defining exactly what our church is and has been doing and making it very clear. We've been calling it the MVV, which is Missions, Value, and Vision. Missions, Vision, and Values. And in that, and he'll talk some more about it during the service, it's three main components. It's engaging God's truth, pursuing life together, and sharing hope in Christ. And this is what the church is already doing. We're excited what the church has been having and being involved in, what God has used through the church. We've been praying for years that this church would be a lighthouse for the community. And he's been doing it through him because he wants us doing that. And a lot of it's been because of you all. So praise God for that. In Ephesians 4, it talks about Jesus Christ as the head of the church. And he... He has equipped us so that each part, when it's properly working, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Well, we're wanting to go even further. As Eric is talking about, we are aggressively pursuing this direction. And so with that in mind, the elders in their great wisdom has decided to request Eric to take a three-month sabbatical. You're going to think, it's going to be starting February 1st. So you're going to think, okay, you're doing an aggressive launch forward. Why would you tell somebody to take a sabbatical? But we'll explain that in just a second. One of the things that we're asking him to do is make sure he turns off his phone. And it's, we'll explain that some more in a second. So two things. A normal sabbatical is taken by a lead pastor once every five to seven years. Eric has been here 18 years, 14 years as the lead pastor. Thank you, Eric. We appreciate it. Well deserved. And what I've come to learn as we've been talking about this is sabbatical is a gift to the church as well as to Eric and his family. Now, the guys that have been helping us with this a lot has a lot of experience in it. One is John Sharp sitting over here, Jay Robinson, a couple of pastors 
in other states, Tom's a pizza, if I say it right. It's been a great resource for this. And as I said, I've really learned a lot about it. John Sharp shared with us in an email that many pastors who have not taken a sabbatical when the time arrived often has suffered the adverse effects of weariness and burnout a few years down the road. Its purpose is not a reward or a summer assignment, but rather a gift for the staff person to cease work in order to attach to God for whatever gift God might give during this time. The sabbatical provides the environment or the greenhouse for a person to be rejuvenated, re-energized, and refocused. A lot of you know Eugene Patterson, Peterson. He also had some comments about a sabbatical. Sabbatical years are the biblically-based provision for restoration when the farmer's field is depleted. It is a given sabbatical. After six years of planting and harvesting, the field is left alone so that the nutrients can build back up. When people are in ministry and depleted, they also are given a sabbatical. Time apart for the recovery of spiritual and creative energies. He went on to say, I have been feeling the need for just such a time of restoration for about two years. The sense that my reserves are low, that my margins of creativity are crowded, becomes more acute each week. I feel the need for some desert time, for silence, for solitude, for prayer. Todd, that I was talking about a minute ago, that's a pastor in Lubbock, Texas, that Maloney Park Church went on to say some things that Eric needs to separate his identity from what he does in the ministry. Does that make sense to everybody? He needs to see that the church is equipped by God to flourish without any assistance from him. That's a very heavy burden for anybody to have, and it must be removed. So what, what does it mean to us? For the three months that he's going to be a sabbatical, we did say you need to turn off your phone. And you won't even be seeing him around here. You'll probably be seeing Lauren some. That's about Eric. What about us? A sabbatical, as I said earlier, is as much a gift for the church as it is for Eric. This is a big learning experience that I've had the last couple of weeks. Todd, I think, summed it up pretty good. <clears throat> but before I go there, la last week, Eric was talking, and he's going to share a little bit more today about 1 Corinthians twelve eighteen, which says, But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So I've always taken this verse to mean, this is talking about us. We're not here by chance. God has actually arranged all of us being here. I've seen it over and over, over the years. So the big question is, we as a body, where do we individually fit in? Everyone here has a ministry that they're supposed to be in. So ask God, where should I be? What should I be doing? Fortunately, at this church, we have a thing called a connection card. I know you probably don't know about that. You hear about it every week, but look at the connection card. Look at all the opportunities that are on there and see where you fit in. If any one of us aren't doing what we're supposed to, it's affecting all the rest of us and we're being cut short. So it's a wonderful thing, and if there's any church that's doing the work, I really believe Fellowship Bible Church is that church. So going back to Todd, he said, Therefore, I believe... It is healthy to set expectations for the con congregation about shepherding. How will it take place in Eric's absence? This will be led with confidence by the plurality of the elder team who will take the primary responsibility to receive calls and step into shepherding when needs are necessary. With that being said, 
The everyday shepherding care should take place within the loving fellowship of the body. This is another benefit of the sabbatical because it reminds the church, every one of us, every member is a minister. In fact, in Matthew 18, it tells us that the involvement of the elders is the last resort, not the first response. I never thought about that before. When I read this, I told Eric, it even takes some of that pressure off of me when I think about it. Read Matthew 18. I read it again. Instead, shepherding always begins between brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what we're here for. It's wonderful. It's amazing, this thing God created through Jesus Christ called church. Okay, what else about us? Things haven't changed here at the church. You can still get a hold of anybody you need to, and you call the church. All the staff of the pastors here exa know exactly who to call and what to do at that moment. The only difference is you're not going to be able to find him. Sorry, Eric. But this is going to let him know and watch what God is going to do through our church. And all the things that we do here is absolutely amazing. You can't drive down this street almost any time, night or day, and not see cars here. And there isn't a whole lot of churches like that. Every time I do that and I go by and see it, I think there's people in there that's learning more and more about God. Praise his name. It is wonderful. So, starting... I said earlier this morning, September 1st, February 1st, for three months. He's still got a couple of sermons to go. So, let's enjoy this time. Fill out your connection cards, and let's make this church really hum. Let me pray. Father God, I know that you've placed in Scripture, in Peter, 1 Peter, as each has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And I just pray, Father, that you would tap us on the shoulder, do whatever it is when you explain to us what we're supposed to be doing, and give us boldness, Father, to step out and do it. I pray, Father, that you would help us to serve the community and lead people to Christ all the time so that they can also enjoy this thing called church. We pray, Father, for Eric, as he's going to be gone during this time, that you would completely rejuvenate him and allow him to come back fresh with all the things that we're tackling in this world. This world is dark, but we have the light to share, Father, because of you, and we are so thankful for you. And we pray this, Father, in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, so as Paul is leaving, I just wanted to express my gratefulness uh, to the elders and to my staff, teammates, and to uh, the body for this opportunity. And that's the, the operative word I'm putting on it is an opportunity I'd be lying if I said I wasn't just a tiny bit scared of it. I'm mostly excited. Um, but, uh, you know, when every time Paul tells me to turn my phone off, I might start twitching like this a little bit. Um, but uh, super grateful for that and mostly grateful to the Lord that he's the head of the church. And uh, as I've thought about it, he gave gifts. These are grace gifts. It's really part of the word grace. So by his grace, he gives gifts to the body. By his grace, he arranges the body just so. Uh, by his grace, he empowers each one of us to do the work of ministry. By his grace, he gives gifted people to equip people in that path. And by his grace, by what every joint supplies, the body builds itself up into the head, which is Jesus. Um, so I'm super excited about it. You know, kind of the killing the elephant in the room of here you are preaching mission, values, vision, and then you're taking off for three months. 
um, I think it's actually the perfect time um, to, um, to do that and to uh, be excited to see how God's going to be glorified in, in his body here at FBC. That's going to be cool when I return. And uh, uh, it's true what he said. It, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to words, the R words that John Sharp has coached me in. Um, and I'm so grateful for John. Um, our rest, um, renewal, refocus. I'm adding in reset <laughs> a little bit. And um, it, it, the thought is that it's all designed to make time and space and rhythm to hear most clearly from God and to be in fellowship with him. And so what a, what a privilege that will be. So praise God for that. Um, speaking of the great things that are going on here at the, the church, I just want to add my endorsement to midweek ministry that's coming up starting this week. Um, appreciated how Eric described, he's a man after my own heart. Why, how can you improve upon describing something other than to say how the Bible describes it? He said, Moses in Deuteronomy explained Exodus. That's cool that he did that. So you don't want to miss that opportunity to dig deeper into the word with, with Eric. Financial peace has been an incredible blessing to many and set a new course of financial practice and freedom in lives um, as we orient ourselves to the fact that it's all God's. Reengage has just literally changed lives. Um, marriages have been restored or have gone from good to great. Um, and the cool part to see in that ministry is how people are paying it forward and returning after participating to uh, be part of the shepherding team uh, to the next crowd that's coming. So that'll be Wednesday, all those three. And then uh, one that's been near and dear to my heart, as you know, is regeneration, which is, we call it life struggles, we call it recovery, but it's really a grace-gridded, gospel-centered, biblical discipleship track, um, which is incredible. I will say one thing, as I've looked at the registration numbers for uh, Regen, there's about five to six women that have registered for every one man. Men, come on. Let's come on. Let's come on. Uh, let's engage. I just want to encourage you, if you're on the fence, just come to Tuesday night Give it a try. Uh, I don't think you will regret it one bit. So it's not too late. Uh, let me lead us in prayer this morning as we get started. Father, thank you for uh, your church. Um, thank you. It, it, it says in Ephesians 5 that you died for the church. Like you, this, this is how much you care about this, this organism that you've made. Um, you died for the church, and um, you call the church your, your bride, the bride of Christ. Um, and so thank you that uh, this bride is in perfect hands with the bridegroom, Jesus. And I pray that uh, he will continue to have his way here, and that we will, as with the strength that he supplies, what every joint supplies, will this body will be built up in love, and that we will see many come to Christ, many grow in Christ, many go in Christ. Uh, so I look forward to that uh, greatly. Uh, so I pray that during our time today, uh, you will be magnified as well. Thank you for the privilege of opening your word together, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. So it was super exciting for me to be able to kick off last week in Mission Values Vision. And I mentioned that we're going to kind of use our four questions to guide our time together. Last week, we talked about who are we and more of an identity statement. Who are we really? And there's three phrases to this identity statement. The first is, we are God's growing church family. Scripture in that Ephesians 4 passage that both Paul and I have been quoting today talks about the head of the church and we grow up into him. So the Bible uses 
church growth language. (laughs) Um, Sometimes people want to cast a crooked eye at it, but God is in the business of building his church and growing his church. So we're God's growing church family, proclaiming the good news of Jesus. You might be thinking that's a what we do statement, and it is in some sense, but it's really, I want to challenge us to think of it as our identity. We are proclaimers. We are witnesses. We are ambassadors. Proclaiming the one who saved us to others, the one who's formed us as a church to others outside of the church. And why do we do it? This is the bonus question that we're answering, a fifth question. Why do we do this? All to the glory of God. Why is this our identity? Because it's all to the glory of God. So we are God's growing church family, proclaiming the good news of Jesus all to the glory of God. That answers who are we? Today, we're going to examine the question, what do we do? What do we do? And it is also sort of a quasi-identity statement, and it's in present tense. I want us to be challenged and remember that we are is in the present. So it's what we do now, and it's what we're going to keep on doing. And there's three things. The first is to we are engaging God's truth. We are engaging God's truth. The second is we are pursuing life together. And the third is sharing hope in Christ. You should be familiar with those three operative words if you've been around the church if for any length of time, engage, pursue, share. Those are three words we didn't want to lose in this process of clarifying our mission, values, and vision. So these are the three planks. Our identity is that we are a growing church family proclaiming the good news of Jesus all to the glory of God. And what do we do in that? Engaging God's truth, pursuing life together, sharing hope in Christ. So I want to take these one at a time. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to look mostly in the New Testament, both in terms of potentially some of the things Jesus had said, but mostly what the, his followers took and said after his ministry here on earth. And then I've slipped in each one of these one Old Testament reference out of the book of Psalms. Now the Psalms was Israel's or is Israel's hymn book. And so their song book, and they would sing these songs out of the Psalms. And I find it fascinating and encouraging that their song book included reference to engaging God's truth, pursuing life together, and sharing hope in Christ to come, that God is the one who saves. And so don't miss the Old Testament references. It's just a faith builder, isn't it? That scripture is so intact and so seamless. Our Old Testament message isn't a throwaway. It points us and guides us right into that New Testament message. So let's start with engaging God's truth. Engaging God's truth, here's perhaps who engaged God's truth better than any of us and anyone ever may yet do, which was the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, if, if you know anything about the book of Acts, Acts is sort of, last week we talked about Acts 1-8, that Jesus in his last words, literal last words was, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is where they were, start where you are. In Judea and Samaria, which is kind of like state of Oklahoma and Texas, the hated one in in our current environment or whatever border state you want to go to, and then to the ends of the earth. So really, from there and everything in between, clear out to to the ends of the globe. And so then in Acts 13, God appoints and calls out from among this one church, at, at Antioch, or excuse me, um, I forget where they were in Acts 13, but he calls out from them these men, Paul and Barnabas, and he says, separate Paul and Barnabas for myself to send out and take the good news and to equip people to engage with my truth and to pursue life together and to s- then build into them that they will build into others to proclaim the good news of Jesus. So in Acts 19, we see one of the examples of that. Paul enters the synagogue in Ephesus, where we get the word Ephesians from. 
He enters the synagogue and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him. This was not an unusual occurrence. Paul would go places and he'd sort of wear out his welcome or they'd get mad about his message. And then he goes and keeps moving on. And he takes these disciples with him and get this, he reasons daily with them in the hall of Tyrannus, still in Ephesus. This continued for two years. Wouldn't that have been cool to be part of Paul's Bible study? For two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, the implication is Paul set up shop in the hall of Tyrannus. So how is it then that all the residents of Asia are going to hear the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks? Well, it seems clear to me, the people who are being equipped there in the hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus are going out to tell others. So this is a natural and inevitable implication of engaging God's truth. But he enters and he digs in deep. Now, in the next chapter, the elders from the church at Ephesus that he basically planted um, come to him and they know that this is the last time probably they're going to see Paul and vice versa. And he says to them, I did not shrink, as he remembers back to his time with them in Ephesus, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. I love that. I remember, um, let's see the shoemakers up here, and I remember talking to John, one of their kids uh, down in Mexico, and kind of the ministry model he told me about is built... Part of it was built off of this phrase, that it was not just all about the gathering, but it was about the going. They would declare in public, in gatherings, and going out, house to house. So many nuggets of engaging God's truth here in these verses. And then later in verse 27, he says this, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Mark that phrase, the whole counsel of God. We're going to see it in a second, reaffirmed in 2 Timothy. Acts 17, a little before that, in Paul's missionary travels, he's been called to go, he's gone, he's going, and he was in Thessalonica, another ancient Near Eastern city, and then he moves on to a place called Berea. We don't see it on these verses here, but these Jews that are being referred to are Berean Jews, <clears throat> and they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, they receive the word with all eagerness, so they receive it, they're eager to do so, and they examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I can't challenge you and encourage you enough to do the same thing with all of us who proclaim the word here. Examine the scriptures to make sure that what we say is so. And they did it with eagerness, and they were in it daily, opening the word and many of them therefore believed God uses his word as we engage with it to bring people to Christ in faith. And not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So just sort of giving a little bit of the uh, complexion of who was coming to faith. So they're in the word themselves, not just getting it fed to them, but they are digging in deeply. And then here's our first Psalms sighting, Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's a synonym for engaging the Bible. His delight is in the Bible. And on his law, he meditates day and night. So consistent immersion in the word. Not just to be in it, but to ruminate on it, to meditate on it, to turn it over, to think on it to process it. He's like a tree. Listen to the life that is found in the word and the security that is found in the word and the flourishing that is found in the word. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Wonderful. And I mentioned that you will see 2 Timothy. We'll close in this one plank with this. 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17 
Paul said in Acts 20, I didn't shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable. How does Timothy, his protege, how, when he writes to Timothy, how does he describe it? All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So you may ask the question, why, what's your strategy for planning preaching? I'll give you an example. I know, you know, I'm going to be gone. And so I uh, mapped out that uh, I looked and saw, what have I not preached out of the whole counsel of God since I've been the lead pastor for these 14 or so years? And one book stood out pretty glaringly, and that was, well, in its companion too, but First Thessalonians. Haven't gone to First Thessalonians before. So, Pastor Jay, I see him on the back row. Pastor John, Pastor Josh, those guys have been meeting about preaching First Thessalonians starting in February. It's going to be awesome. And they're going to have a little side trail, an excursus trail coming out of that that's going to, func- to focus on end times and God snatching his church away out of wrath and wonderful, wonderful sharing of the whole counsel of God. And that's why on average, more often than not, what you're going to find us doing is going through books and sections of the Bible. And the wonderful thing about that is you don't miss out on the topics that are important because the topics that are in the the going through and contextual in the context of how they're written just leap off the pages of Scripture for us. But interestingly, we also have the joy of being able to present some um, woven together topics while I'm gone. You know, the elders are many of whom many of them are going to be preaching uh, sermons that God has placed on their hearts. I think it's incredible that you guys are going to hear from the elders. It's great. And they're going to be sharing with you what God has placed on their hearts that they think is the most important sermon they need to preach to share with this local body of which they are under shepherds. Yeah, I can't wait to, to pick those up on, um, you know, the stream after the fact. But um, So anyway, just exciting to be exposed and engage with God's truth. And do it in, a, in the re- reality that it is profitable to equip us to be complete. And that the whole counsel of God is where it's at. He's got all of the stuff we need as we go through his counsel. Second, pursuing life together. Isn't that awesome? So as a church body, we pursue life together. And I think you're going to be excited to see how scripture frames this up. First, look at Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. First element is to hold fast together the truth that we have engaged with. And then we don't just hold it fast, but we challenge one another and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And then the last lens is that we do it with the view in mind that the day of his return and judgment that's coming with that is coming. So we do it more and more. And remember, when we engage in the truth and when we pursue life together, it's not always just for our quote unquote holy huddle. It's an inevitable, there's an inevitable outcome of this that we spread it out and take it out to the world around us. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12. We've re- referenced it multiple times today. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You have been given a spiritual gift or gifts, what? For the common good. We need each other. I need you, you need me. And then in verses 24 through 26, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. The classic, ultimate, all for one, one for all. 
here we are. This is us. Galatians 6, 2 and 10, Apostle Paul writes to the church in Galatia, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then in verse 10, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I love how this pursuing life together is, is not static and it's not inert. It is active. It is engaged. And we lift one another up. We carry burdens for one another. And we do good to everyone, especially the body of Christ. And here's our psalm citing, Psalm 133. I'm jealous of Aaron in this psalm, the brother of Moses, because he must have a really cool beard. I can't grow a cool beard. But it would be cool if I could, because what a delightful sensation it would be. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which was a mountain in, in Israel, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Do you see, even the Old Testament is the precursor for life together. He prescribes it through the Israel's songbook. Live together, dwell together, be in unity. And he, the punchline of the psalm at the end is, there's, the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This is where the life and the blessing is found in pursuing life together. And then Romans 1, 11 and 12, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. This is again, the apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome. He's got this burning desire to see them. And he, it's not just to see them, but to be able to bless them with his gifting as they bless him with theirs. And the body gets built up. And in so doing, they mutually encourage each other's faith. This is biblically pursuing life together. This is doing so according to the scriptures. There's nothing like it. And then finally, sharing hope in Christ. Sharing hope in Christ. And again, in the book of Romans... The Apostle Paul writes in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So it, it reminds us that this is God's power at work. It's not our power. We carry a powerful spiritually powerful, supernaturally powerful message to others. And Jesus is the one who saves. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, Paul reminisces about their time in Thessalonica. And he says, Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction. Let me stop there. Do you notice how Paul's ministry was a word and deed ministry? He's obviously proclaiming, but look what it says. We came to you in power and the Holy Spirit as convicted people, and they proved themselves through the kind of people they were. So this sharing hope in Christ is all about both and. Scripture's consistent again. It's both sharing the words. Don't ever think you get a pass on that or I get a pass on that. We got to declare it. And it's demonstrating it, putting it into action. That's another way we share hope in Christ. And they did it even in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. You know, I do get a little twitchy about the, the kind of the blurry line between my identity and my job here, quote unquote. But man, a verse like this sort of reminds me, dude, that's a non-starter. 
You're here to do your part. And you know what? Paul did his part and he said, you all took that message and you took it all over the place and it's gone forth everywhere so that I don't even need to say anything. Isn't that cool? That's how this all works in the body of Christ. And in 1 John 3, here's another love in action verse. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. I think we got another psalm on the way. This is a famous psalm for the mission enterprise of the of the church. It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. And then there's that uh, Hebrew break word, Selah. And then it says that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. You see, when we share the hope of Christ and we take it, I love that how John McNally shared with us. He said, there's Asrat and how do you say his wife's name? Frey. They're over in Ethiopia. John and Kay went as sent ones at one point in time. Now they're mostly here. Frey, they talked about this upcoming next week equipping they're going to do. And you know what that's going to result in? Is that all the folks who come to that are going to then go back and to their places and start where they are. And then it's going to multiply it out. And you ought to ask John about the stories of how this has happened, that God has done this. It's been incredible. And that results at the end of the day in that his, the God's saving power is known among the nations. And the people praise him. And we always keep in mind that our aspiration is that let all the peoples praise God. And finally, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And boy, I want to just challenge each of us with this one. This is very personal. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. You notice the language there? Always being prepared. How does that happen? through engaging God's truth, through sharing, pursuing life together. That's how this works. And we get equipped in it. We get encouraged in it. We get exhorted in it. And people ask us, where's that hope? They're going to see these things and they're going to say, what's going on over there? Yet you do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. This tips the hand toward next week's message on how do we do what we do. We do it with gentleness and respect. Here's one example. Scripture's, uh, I think, full of both what we do and how we do it. So, here's how it looked in the very first church that God made. Acts chapter 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is an incredible passage. It made me want to preach it as a side sermon right now. But notice the elements. I love how scripture from the Psalms to the epistles to this narrative book of Acts 2 is consistent. They engaged God's truth, the apostles' teaching. They pursued life together breaking bread, fellowship, prayer. They even shared their goods in common so that none had need. And they went out. They had favor with all the people. And the wonderful concluding statement is, but you know what? It's God who was doing all of it and adding to his church. The Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. If I could put it in a sort of on the curb kind of a way they did their part was to do the engage 
God's truth, pursue life together, and share their hope in Christ, God's part was, I save people, and I use you in that process. That's awesome. That, why do we think somehow that that's some romantic ideal picture? This is the first church. That's how, that's how it started, and that's how it needs to keep going here at FBC. So I'll close with a little story about my own family experience. We talk about a church family. Let me tell you about my family. And the reason why I wanted to share this last little quick story was because you could have listened to my sermon today and thought, it's all about what we do, what we do. Checklist. Get, make sure I do enough. So when I was, uh, you know, I'm, I wish I was one of those dads who'd say, I look back on every parenting move I ever made and I have zero regrets, but that's just not true. But <clears throat> there was a point about a decade or so ago where I pivoted, where God got a hold of my heart and he kind of crushed me and broke me and built me back up to where <clears throat> before that, I was more concerned with do, do, do. Let me just make sure you hear the, you hear the message, young man, young lady. And here's the truth. And, you know, I don't want to sound, I mean, I did some good things as a dad, okay? They, they would tell you so. But here's the deal. I know in my heart that I cared probably as much or more about, did you get it right? Did you get it done the right way? Um, even the pursuing life together as a family was like a bit of a checkbox for me. And then God just sort of, you know, broke me of that. And so what I've learned is that what my kids want and my wife wants the most out of me is they want to be with me. They want to be in relationship. And we're going to have missed it if uh, Jesus said to Mary and Martha, and Martha gets a bad rap. She was, she was good. She was doing good stuff. But in that moment, Jesus said to Mary, who was at his feet, just communing with him and worshiping him, Mary has chosen the better part. I'm with you here. Be with me. And I want to challenge us as a church to be with Jesus. If, if what we're trying to do is mark things on a connection card and do stuff, we will have missed it. But here's the beautiful way God works. When we are with him and we're falling in love with him more and we are learning from him more, he, cha he sets our heart ablaze with passion and desire to be a part of what he's doing and to do the things that he's laid out for us to do. And then the cool part, maybe it's because they've drafted off of me, but my kids, and they'll tell you this, I always, my speech is repetitive. When my birthdays come around, I just had one in December and I said, don't give me any gifts. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so they give me gifts, right? So that's cool. That's so nice. And they're really getting clever in their adult years about how to give gifts. They give like really cool gifts. So I'm not sure I want to keep saying, don't give me gifts. <laughs> but really what I want is I want the girls who live at OKC and all the rest of us who live in Tulsa to meet at that barbecue joint in Stroud at the halfway point. That's what I want. I just want to be with them. They know my script, <laughs> but they need to know that I love them and I'm going to be there for them. And man, the quality and depth of relationship has just flourished as we've just been with each other. And I just want to challenge us as a church to be with our head, Jesus. And in the being with him, yeah, he wants us to engage with his truth. He wants us to pursue the life that we have in him together with our fellow body members. He wants us to share the hope that we have in him with others. These are commissions. These are commands. These are mandates. But the bottom line is, let's be with him. Let's be with him. And uh, I just know in my little microcosm, it's, it's no accident that it works this way in little miniature versions of family, that 
it's, it's made all the difference in ours. So as God's growing church family, y'all, this is enough to, to, to get excited about. As God's growing church family, proclaiming the good news of Jesus all to the glory of God, we are engaging God's truth, pursuing life together, and sharing hope in Christ. Let's grab our connection cards and uh, let's get all, all 100% of them in our basket, uh, baskets as they come around the aisles here. So we're building on these prayer requests week by week. Last week we said, please pray with me that I will pray for FBC. I pray that you did pray for FBC, and I pray that again this week you will pray for this church to be all that it is to be biblically. And then this week, please pray with me that I will participate in the mission of Fellowship Bible Church. Perhaps as you're filling out the connection card for these next steps, you can Find your place on the card, or uh, you can contact that office, like Paul said, and just participate in this great engage the truth, pursue life together, share the, the hope in Christ mission that He has given us. So let's take a moment to fill these out together and then drop them in the baskets as they come by. sure and include your prayer request for us too. We, we definitely want to be lifting those up. God bless you. I love you. Thank you so much, Pastor Eric, and for those